Okay. So, um, up to this point, there's been a lot of discussion around sediment, uh, how you handle it, how you can predict it. If you want to try to characterize what a watershed sediment generation issue is, um, we'll talk about that here. And then at the end, there's something Lauren's going to be interested in is, this is great, but what if you can't measure turbidity on a reliable basis? What options do you have? And so we'll talk about how, how we're going to do that, and we'll show you a simulation around how we think it's going to work um, when we get in practice. Um, Mary and I spend our time in three areas. Um, we have a, a bunch of work focused on a small watershed where a um, utility in Delaware is trying to pump water out. And so our job has been to represent about 2,500 people and protect their interests in, in the watershed. The second part is um, supporting monitoring of White Clay Creek. And then the third is, uh, is the activity we're doing right here. Um, we're part of a, a two-member, three-member team called WHAT, and it stands for um, Watershed Hydrological Analysis Team. So we're focusing on hydrology and developing techniques that um, people like us can use, and you don't have to be an academic and have that kind of background in order to be able to use these tools. And so it's really in three areas. The first is a lot of modeling, both on the streams, watershed models, runoff models, uh, aquifer general aquifer models to be able to predict water levels in the aquifer, how much water comes out of the aquifer, for example, and, and goes into a stream. And then uh, a number of techniques around uh, data analysis, one we'll talk about today with regard to uh, TSS and turbidity and so on sediment. And then on the bottom is we use uh, different types of analysis techniques to look for correlations to make it simple so that we don't have to run complex um, uh, models, programs, I should say. Um, the example I'll use is the Broad Run Watershed. And this is a um, watershed that is in, it focuses on here at Somerset Lake, and it's around 28 acres. And then there's a housing developments around this, of course. And so this is a kind of a premium housing area, if you will, in this area. And the issue is in the northern part of the watershed, which is, a, you know, let's say nominally um, a little over one square mile, is contributing a fair amount of sediment into the lake. And every couple of years, they have to spend a couple hundred thousand dollars in bringing dredging and pull all that sediment out. And so well, the objective was to figure out how can we quantify this, what is coming in, and then characterize what the current state of the watershed is and develop a model that will be able to be sensitive enough and accurate enough to detect changes, either negative changes in the watershed because of development or positive changes in the case of making improvements in the um, discharge area, the banks, and so on to reduce sediment. And then to work with the township in Somerset Lake to um, get grants and other monies to, to do this on a long-range program, because this is not the kind of program you can be done in a, in a couple of years. Um, so when you look at sediment, it's, first of all, there's a lot of variables in there, and it's complex. And uh, so for us, we wanted to find something that was relatively simple that hadn't been done in the literature, at least that we could find, to be able to correlate erosion to a uh, a very few set of variables for a particular watershed. So we focused on the hydrograph. We said everything that happens in that watershed must, their information is somewhere in that hydrograph because of the rainfall that comes in, the rate at which the rain hits, how big those raindrops are, and then topography of the land and so on. And if you put all that together, the runoff rate and the amount of surface runoff, the amount of water in total that comes off that watershed should be able to correlate that to the amount of sediment that's being generated. That was our hypothesis. You're welcome. <laughs> um, and so we developed what we'll call a sediment runoff intensity index, which is the product of runoff intensity, which is the slope of the rising curve here, plus uh, the amount of water that's generated 
um, in runoff up until a point when rain ceases. In order to start to do this, of course, uh, we do what everybody else does is we correlate what we record as turbidity on the sensor and the turbidity in the laboratory. Because in the laboratory, we have uh, standards. We make sure that we have it calibrated. And so uh, this is the correlation we use. And then we take that correlation and grab a number of samples in the field. And you can see down at the lower end here, we got pretty good correlation. And we're not far from the 1.9 to, to 2 to 1 ratio. However, it's pretty difficult to get samples up in this very high range because now you're talking very high runoff events. And, you know, some of this data, we, there could be a big error band on, on this in terms of where it really is. But what we think may be going on here with this data, and we just correlated that with a, a fourth order quadratic is a uh, polynomial, I should say, is that this data probably has um, a lot of sediment in it that's not being measured by the turbidity meter. And so if it were really measuring this properly, that NTU would be out here, and this curve would look like this. Okay? It's not going to flip well, up. It's going to flip up. The turbidity read on the sensor or from the lab? This is lab. lab. Right. So they're taking actual samples and then measuring it. Right. So um, when we um, when we plot this index up now, and this is an example on this stream, we get a pretty high correlation of 99%. So this is a signature, and this represents data from two different years. So it's not just a single year with a data point or a single runoff event. Multiple runoff events spread over a couple of years. And so a pretty consistent uh, you know, data pattern. Now, I then went into the literature and pulled out a number of streams ranging from East Branch of the Brandywine, Ridley Creek Upstream, um, White Clay Creek, Mill Creek, East Branch of the Brandywine, Red Clay, French, and Penny Pack. Um, these I chose because there's USGS stations. I didn't do Pickering. Um, I should have, though, considering all the work I heard today there. And so I took the selected data points on each of these to see what the slope would be. You can see each watershed seems to have a different slope. Okay. Now, what I will say is these data points don't come from multiple years because I only have three or four data points on each of these watersheds. So I chose 2018 because we had an awful lot of rain runoff events in that year. It was easy to go in and pick the same runoff time frames that we did for the work we did at Rug Run. So when I look at this, the first thought was, okay, these slopes are unique for the particular watershed, but is there a correlation between watersheds? And so I ran a multivariable analysis with the drainage area of the watershed, the square root, drain slope, and the slope of the first and second order streams and tributaries that make up that stream, and then um, the percentage of soil type that's A and D. Um, and just for those of you who remember, soil type A is very high infiltration. Soil type D is very low. So very low means very high runoff. And then the percent of cultivated crops. And uh, what I found out was a 98% correlation when I put these slopes on this curve um, for the observed sediment slope. And so, if, uh, and I ran a test then, is I chose a site which um, is near us that was down in this region, was able to predict based on this what the slope should be, and the data fell right on the curve. So um, it worked well in this case because the turbidity curve, we were able to select rain events where we thought that the data was accurate. And there are runoff events where 
you're not sure you can use it because you have very high turbidities coming into the runoff event, and you just don't see the kind of uh, movement in the turbidity probe in the data you would. And that's the problem that, that Lauren has in that downstream location. So we did those three things we did. The first thing we did is we went into this stream, and this stream has a huge problem with algae and branches and every other thing coming down from this short watershed. Because there's a lot of ponds up, upstream, and when you get a runoff event, algae comes down and it strings around the, the sensor, and then you get these wild deviations. And so you spend a lot of time looking at your turbidity data, trying to decide, is that a valid data point, or is it an exclusion, right? Do I have to exclude that data point because it's an outlier? So what we did is we took a PVC, a four-inch PVC pipe, or six-inch, remember what it was, four, cut it in half, put it upstream so that it acts as a little bit of a deflector. The stream does come around, and you do get backflow in, so you do get a fairly good representation of what the turbidity should be. That is, a reasonable representation of what the environment would be without having a shield there. And it does begin to protect the uh, sensor. I don't have a plot of that, but you can see in the sensor during a runoff event, you see there's a lot of um, chatter just before the runoff event. And then when the runoff event comes, all of a sudden the chatter drops down and you get a very nice smooth curve because all the algae is being literally like a, a flag in the wind. It just comes up and rises then above the sensor and you get a good sensor reading. So for for some of you, this may be a, a useful method of protecting the sensor from uh, debris and other things that might hang up around that. Because for sure, if you, unless you're in there cleaning after every rain event, you're going to have debris hung up on that sensor. So, I have a question: what, what is the look range of those sensors? I mean, the put out. I think it depends on the turbidity, but well, I mean, if it's, if it's you know, clear or sort of murky. Marion, what do you think? Well. According to the literature, actually, you can sort of see this when you look at the data. It, it can actually see out about this far in clear water. Okay, so if you have and a it, truck it, and anywhere... As soon as, right, and you'll see that, but you'll see algae or something flopping past it, so you'll see a spike, and that's okay, and it's spike. Whereas, and as soon as the turbidity increases, the, the sensor... Right really doesn't detect anything out there because the scattering is in this little right, little hemispherical thing. I mean, it's this little ball of material there. So it just sees the, the light up really close. It's scattered. Mm -hmm. So that's why the, the high numbers tend to look better. And the high numbers are what we're interested in anyway. We're, right. We don't have numbers, unfortunately, that are down in the... Right. You know, well, the our large creek is there's three or four MTU. But there's no slope, so we don't have yeah. that issue. So we are in the process of developing two different types, two prototype uh, auto samplers. The, the first is um, a Rube Goldberg auto sampler, okay? Um, it's literally a four by four with bottles put on the side, and which is not particularly innovative. The innovation that Marion provided is cutting the bottles in half and putting a, golf, a ping pong ball inside so that when the water level comes up, it fills it, and that ping pong ball there protects it from, from contamination after, the, um, after it fills at that level. So then you use your depth sensor to know what's the flow rate and what time in the runoff event have you taken your sample? So theoretically, Lauren could use a device like this and load that into a stream up a meter and a half and take samples all the way, right? Um, the other... <laughs> I love... So the ping pong is in the bottom, so the water drops... It's, 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 in the, it's in the ball. We just cut it open, put the ping pong ball in, seal right. it back up. But so when the water drops down, it traps the water in the bottle? No, when the, when the water starts to fill up, the ping pong ball will float up to the top, right? and it stays there. Because when the flow comes over the top of the bottle, that's a low pressure area, 
And that ping pong ball just sits right up there at the top oh, of the throat. Okay. And so you just turn the ball down. upside down, the ball floats up the other way, and the ball is right into another container. You know, the image of that? I don't, no. It's uh, pretty confidential, Dave. <laughs> 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 Uh, the second option is a uh, is a true auto sampler, and Marion, um, we have a a sonic sensor probe. Um, we could have easily just tied this into a Mayfly with the depth sensor, but we didn't want to. We wanted to have two separate units, so we used a sonic depth sensor to measure the water level. And strapped in beside here are two uh, pumps activated by Mayfly. And we have a very sophisticated um, gallon jug of milk, uh, former milk jug, which we use to collect the sample. And it pumps it for 20 seconds and, and puts about a liter of material in that gallon jug. Um, so theoretically, what we're trying to do is catch a runoff of in here. And this is a simulation of Ridley Creek, actually, uh, on the upstream portion. We're looking at taking a sample at about seven centimeters just after the runoff event starts, and then we want to catch it just after the peak when it starts to come down. And then what we do is we take the sediment at each of these locations, divide it by the flow rate, and average it, and then multiply it by the total quantity of water up to the peak flow. Okay? And then we correlate that for every runoff event. And down here, what we are, what we'll show you is that these are manual samples from the manual operation compared to the in-stream sensor. So we measure in turbidity of that actual sample versus what we took out of the um, out of the sensor. And uh, this is the data for if I t eliminate these three data points. That's the data we had after a couple of rain events, at which time we thought, gee, it's pretty representative. You know, that's a pretty good slope. It's correlated. And then we got these three data. And all of a sudden, we started thinking, oh, yeah, there's variability in these streams, a lot of variability in what the sediment is vertically and laterally across that stream. And so... Um, then we look at the auto sampler, and we've had a very similar situation develop, but it is correlatable. So what we need more data because we need to see how good this correlation is when we get more data points, given the variance we have. But right now, we have a hypothesis that we're spending a lot of time worrying about how accurately our turbidity is, and in fact, the real problem is there's tremendous variability in the distribution of, of that turbidity in the stream. So much more variability that maybe the best you could hope for in this situation is collect a lot of data and use it as a trend analysis. That you were integrating this and trying to do it to two or three significant digits, but it's, yeah. that's really not representative. That it's just a kind of a trend around is it going up, is it going down? Now, if we assume that this data is accurate, or at least precise, let's say that, the question is, how would we do this then? Well, when we look at the manual sampler, and we took that analysis that I proposed back here, and did this on both the manual sampler and the auto, we end up with a 97% correlation between the prediction of the sediment generated versus the integration of the hydrograph for that runoff of that, okay? And in this case, in our watershed, we have a slope of this line a little over two, okay? And when we did this with the auto sampler, um, we got a slightly different um, correlation, okay? Now, what we find is that, oh, yeah. Now the question becomes, if we do this at other, at other watersheds that are different, 
can this work? Is it correlatable? And the answer is, yeah, it's correlatable to the square root of the watershed area at about 99%. Now, that's only three data points, but I got lazy. I didn't feel like generating a whole bunch of new data. But so it's a pretty strong suggestion that, okay, this may be correlated. This technique is doing something allowing us to estimate that at a precision, may not be accurate, but at a precision that is much better than the precision that we have in doing the measurement in the stream to begin with. Okay, so we plan to use this technique at Broad Run to sort of help us give uh, directionally, are we making improvements in the watershed or is it getting worse over time? That this will be a kind of a um, signature, if you will, of that watershed to allow us to test it. And that's it. Questions for Yeah. It's my brain is full. Yeah. You're <laughs> right. Is, is maybe, I guess what I'm thinking is maybe we shouldn't be going this turbidity and TSS direct analysis on a minute by minute basis. In other words, the idea that we're getting, or do we need to look at it more in an event by event situation? Because I think about like my uses and what I care about, like the Cherry Creek, for example. And what I'm really expecting with anything else is that it's during a rain event or a storm event that I'm going to be seeing differences. And low water is fine. It's when it kicks up the sediment, and in us, it's also a lot of legacy too. It's coming up from the bottom. Also, some of it's because it's cutting through an old um, lake bed, or some of it has nothing to do with agriculture or anything else. It's just mm -hmm. that's the way it is. Um, so, looking at things like the runoff of temperature or, or the slope of that rising limb, and correlating that with the total suspended solids or the amount that's transmitted during a whole event. In other words, instead of looking minute by minute. Should we be looking at event by event? I mean, I'm just thinking about scale. In other words, are we trying to serve, get go for something we can't get? Well, one of the things Mike mentioned, which which um, is actually the early work that we did, is we didn't worry about sediment. Right. We just used turbidity as a surrogate. Right. And if you do the same analysis with turbidity, you 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 get a very similar trend. You can get right. slopes and and be able to quantify that, and then. Um, if you assume a two to one or 1.7 to one ratio, just do your analysis based on turbidity at the very end, just multiply it by two and say, okay, that's a rough estimate of what the sediment would be. But is it falling apart at the high end? I guess the question is, is when it's falling apart,